A plain-clothed detective is a man under many pressures. His life is lived in contact with crime. Most crimes involve money, sometimes a great deal of money. And it can happen that a detective solves a crime involving money, but somehow the money stays missing. Then he's on the spot. Ugly whispers start behind his back. And only he knows whether he is innocent or... There was money missing. Sixty grand, to be exact. Tony Belmont and two hoods took it away from the Summit Finance Company by holding up one of their messengers. But I thought I recognized the description the messenger gave of the leader. And I brought in Tony. But I, uh, didn't bring in the money. And Sixty grand's a lot of dough. So there was bound to be talk. Well, talk's cheap. And I wasn't surprised when I walked into the precinct house... Got a sour look from Sergeant Bronson on the desk. Hello, Bronson. What's booked? Hello, Dresden. Don't be so enthusiastic. It's bad for your heart. I said, what's booked? A couple of break-ins, kid stuff, no money in them. What's that supposed to mean? I wouldn't know, Dresser. I want to see Sloppy Peters. Where is he? You could look downstairs on the pistol range. Thanks. I think. <laughs> I went down the splendid old stairs to the pistol range in the basement. Sloppy Peters was my sidekick. He usually dressed like a scarecrow after a bad winter. If he ate soup, Sloppy spilled it on himself. If he got his hand dirty, he mopped his hand over his face, got that dirty too. Half the time, his socks didn't match. But he knew his job. Down on the range, Sloppy was popping away with his police special. Hiya, Sloppy. Hiya. Hey, Sloppy, I said hello. Yeah, I heard you. Hey, what's eating you? Why should anything be eating me? Well, that's what I'm asking you. Hey, hey, you're holding your gun wrong again. Let me show you. There. Five in the black. Hey, Sloppy, where are you going? But Sloppy Peters had turned his back and walked out. I spent the afternoon going over the breakings, got back to the precinct in the evening. I was uh, checking out. I had on a new outfit, $150 buck tan linen suit, custom-made silk shirt, $50 two-tone shoes, and a $10 tie. But what was anybody to say? Clothes were my gimmick, <laughs> my trademark. The newspapers even had a nickname for me, Nifty Dresser. And besides, as I said, it was vacation time for me. I expected a comment on my new duds from Bronson, but he just looked at me and looked away. Hey, Bronson. Bronson, I'm talking to you. Oh, it's your dresser. What do you want? Just a civil answer. Is Sloppy Peters around? Should he be around? Never mind whether he should be or not, is he? I couldn't say, dresser, I couldn't say. Maybe he's out looking for some missing dough. Yeah. Just what, uh, dough did you have in mind? Oh, I heard tell something about a payroll being missing. Somebody, I forget his name, caught the hold-up guy all right, but somehow the money got mislaid. Sixty grand, I think it yeah, was. that's right. That's right, sixty grand. And it was me who caught the hot rod who stole it. Tony Belmont. So it was, so it was. It all comes back to me now. Congratulations. Too bad you didn't find the dough, too. Or did you? Maybe we can finish this interesting discussion uh, later on, Sergeant. Right now, I'm looking for Peters. Anytime, dresser, anytime. I turned on my heel and walked out. By now, the talk was all over the precinct. And Sloppy had broken up with his old sidekick, Nifty Dresser, because of this missing 60 grand and hold up loop. But I had to find Sloppy. So I started making the rounds. A little later, I dropped into the Ace Bowling Alley on 10th Avenue to have a little chat with Ace himself. Yes, sir. Hey, hey, say, man, you're hip tonight. You're really hip. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Wait, I'll put on my dark glasses before I look at you. It's a uh, new outfit. You like it, huh? Well, if this was Christmas, I'd just stand you in the corner to be the Christmas tree. Looks like money. Real money. Yeah, yeah. It does at that, huh? Say, uh, I uh, hear you're going on vacation tomorrow. That's right. Two weeks at the beach. Are you coming back in two weeks, I suppose? 
Well, certainly I'm coming back. Why shouldn't I be? Oh, uh, no reason, no reason. Uh, unless uh, maybe you came into money and decided to live it up. My rich uncle left me out of his will. He always hated cops. What's on your mind, Ace? Oh, nothing personal, Dresser. Uh, but there's a uh, telephone around. Yeah, such as? Uh, well, last week, tree hunt rods hold up the Summit Finance Company and get away with 60 grand. A clerk was able to describe one of them. That's right. I recognize the description. Tony Belmont. So... So you picked up Tony in his room. You left Sloppy Peters downstairs and handled Tony single-handed. Uh, you were alone with him 15 minutes. Oh, I spent 15 minutes trying to make him tell me who the two muscle men were who helped him. Why, anything wrong with that? Am I saying that was? But the talk goes around that Tony still has that 60 grand. He hadn't split it up yet. Tony isn't talking, of course. Tony never talks. But there's some people who think that 60 grand is still around. Well, of course it's still around. Everybody, including my sidekick, Sloppy Peters, thinks I got my mitts on that 60 grand and then latched on to it, right? That's the talk, Dresser. That's the talk. Well, let him talk, Ace. Talk is one thing. Proving it is another. I left the Ace Bowling Alley and went on making the rounds. A bar here, a dance hall there. All places where I might pick up a whisper of interest to a cop. At each place, I asked for Sloppy Peters, but nobody had seen him. Apparently, Sloppy had crawled into a hole and disappeared. It wasn't like him. I wanted to find Sloppy. And I wanted to find two unknown muscle men who'd been in with Tony Belmont on that holdup. Even if by any chance I was planning on taking a vacation, from which I uh, wouldn't bother to come back, I didn't want to leave those two hoods on the loose... I wanted them behind bars for a long time. Then in a pool parlor at night, I got my first lead from Nick the Pick, a combo pickpocket and pool shark. Oh, God. Hello, Nick. Watch me put the seven ball in the side pocket. Hey, nice shot. The rumble is you're looking for your sidekick. You seen him? Right ball in the end pocket. Well? Answering in words of one syllable? No. And what's your interest? Nine ball in the side pocket. Yeah. I never met. Neither do I. Now, what do you know about Sloppy Peters? Oh, that was a guy. What do you say? Ten ball in the end pocket. What did he say? I waged his bar and grill half an hour ago. Thanks. How much? I started down the dark side street for Luigi's Bar and Grill. The trail was getting hot now, too hot. Because the red neon sign that said Luigi's was 50 yards ahead of me when footsteps scuffed in the doorway just as I passed. Something jabbed into my back and a voice said, Okay, close horse. Stand quiet with your hands up. Or I'll give you a chance to see how you like the new two-piece back wall. Just a moment. We will return for the second. It was a gun in my back. And there were two men behind me, a big one and a little one. I recognized the voices. Phil Whip, the little one, and Wheezy Blaine, the big one. Wheezy took my gun and then frisked me. Fifty bucks, that's all he's got. The dough ain't here. Well, what do you expect? Did he be carrying it on him? They could have sixty grand in his pocket? He's got it hid someplace. Hello, right? Phil, Wheezy. So you two mental giants were the ones in on the finance company hold up with Tony Belmont. Shut huh? up, Dresser. We'll do the talk. So he laid a trap for me, huh? You knew I was looking for Sloppy Peters. He left word he was in Luigi's to get me to come this way. All right, since you feel so much like talking. Talk! About what? About where you hid the stuff. What stuff? Let me slap his ears, Phil. That'll make him nah, talk. I'll slap your nose. Professor, we know you got that 60 grand hid someplace. You know more than I do. Okay, you're asking for it. Oh. <laughs> now let me clip him one. Thing. I'll clip you. Just keep your eyes open so we ain't interrupted. Okay, Phil. Okay, but he's got to He'll talk. talk. He'll sing like a quartet. Now listen, Dresser. I'm listen, listening, but so far I don't hear much. Now we know you got the dough. Tony Belmont slipped weight on a grapevine. You took it. You can fool the police commissioner, but you're not putting anything over on us. After you and that, Belmont, you managed to hide the payroll loot someplace. Now, where is it? Suppose I say I don't know. 
In that case... Oh, oh, you... We can keep this up all night, you know. Question is, can you take it all night? What about it, Dresser? Okay. Maybe I know where the money is. Okay, then. Since you know where it is, suppose you tell us. I, uh... I hid it in the junkyard behind Belmont's room and house. The junkyard? Yeah, Phil, there is a junkyard right out the back way and down the yeah, alley. That's it. I locked Belmont in the closet. See, I wrapped the door in a newspaper, and I went down the back way while Sloppy Peters waited for me out front. Then I hid the money, went back and got Belmont, and I, uh, I took him down the front way. You cops are all alike. The only difference between you and us is we admit we're crooks. The difference between you and me... Is it your stupid? Now, can I clip him, Phil? No. No, he's going to lead us to the dough. There's an alley ahead, lease to that junkyard. Start moving, dresser. I started moving. With a gun nudging me in the kidney, there was nothing else to do. We went down a long, dark alley, listening to the televisions playing in the buildings we passed. The people quarreling, babies crying. Then we came to a high board fence that surrounded the junkyard, and I, I stopped what are you stopping for? Well, uh, here's the junkyard. How are we going to get in? You got in the other time. You can get in this time. Oh, that was from the other alley. You see, there was a, a loose board. Where is he? Yeah, Phil. Look for a loose board so we can get through this fence. Weezy Blaine began yanking at the fence while Phil Whip kept the gun grinding hard into my back. I was in no hurry. I knew they were figuring on killing me as soon as they had their hands on the money. Shooting me in the back and leaving me along with the old boilers and wash tubs in the junkyard. Oh, I was perfectly willing to postpone that as long as possible. Then, Wheezy Blaine found a loose board. Phil used his gun to steer me to the opening, and we all squeezed through. Okay, what are you stopping for? I'm uh, just trying to figure where we are. Now, uh, the other time I got in this junkyard from the other side... If you're Stalin, you're going to be sorry. I hid the money inside an old furnace someplace about the middle. Uh, yeah, ought to be over this way, here. Yeah. I led the way toward the center of the junkyard. Rusty iron ripped holes in my new suit. And a cat jumped up snarling. There were a million people inside a few blocks of us, but there in the silence of that deserted junkyard, Phil and Wheezy and I might have been the last men alive in the whole world. Okay. Now what are you stopping for? Uh, someplace around here I hit the dough. Uh, one of these old furnaces. Uh, which one? Now don't try to stall. Listen, I was in a hurry. I crammed the money into an old furnace. Now just let me look in this one here. No, 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 it's not here. Uh, maybe it's that one over there. Now my suit was covered with a messy black stain. from reaching around inside the furnace. There wasn't much left of my outfit by now, but... This was my life that was worrying me, not my clothes. They followed close behind me as I worked my way toward the other furnace. An overturned bathtub lay about ten feet from it. And on the bathtub, a black cat sat and just watched us. Hey, look at Phil. A black cat, that's bad luck. Yeah, bad luck for Dresser if this ain't the right furnace. Because then I'll know he's stalling. No, 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 no. This is it. I'm positive of it. Yeah, the package is right inside the firebox. Yeah. Here it is. It's right here. Just a moment, we will return for the concluding act of Sus. I reached inside the antique furnace, and there was the package. But it didn't hold any money. It held a revolver. As soon as I had it in my hands, I dropped to my knees and I yelled, Okay, stop me, shoot! Well, the bathtub is shooting out of house. It's a trick dresser up with your wagon! <laughs> I ducked behind some scrap iron. Before Weezy Blaine could find cover, he grunted and fell over an old washed up and lay there. Phil Whip started to run. I couldn't get a shot at him. But the bathtub of Sloppy Peters was hiding under heave and jerk from top low. Sloppy stood up a six-foot scarecrow and lifted his gun. <laughs> Phil Whip fell into some rusty machinery and lay there, not even moving. Sloppy Peters put his gun away and came over to help me up. I had gotten tangled up in some loose wire. Okay, Johnny. Give me a hand. 
That's it. Oh. Thanks, Sloppy. Now, uh, let's find the money. It's here, is it? Well, sure it is. I told you it was. In the same boiler where I had the gun hid. I'll get it right out. Yeah. Yeah, here it is. In the pillowcase, I dumped it in after I cuffed Tony Belmont. Yeah. <laughs> Stay just as safe as in a vault. Let's have a look at it. Sure. Pretty, isn't it? Yeah, very pretty. Now, let me have it. Let you have it. All of it. Now, don't argue, Johnny. Your gun? What the devil? The money, Johnny. You want all of it? All of it. Start walking, Johnny, toward the street. And don't hurry. We have a little trip to take. The sloppy Peter's gun nudging me, I did what he said. Oh, I was tired of having guns in my ribs. But his grim look told me he wasn't full. We hailed a cab and it took us to headquarters, and then we walked up to see the commissioner's office. Sloppy put the pillowcase of money on the commissioner's desk and told him the story. Do I understand, Detective Peters, that you are charging Detective Dresser with trying to appropriate this $60,000 for himself? Yes, sir. I, uh, I hate to do it. Believe me, Johnny, I'd rather cut off my arm. There's nothing else I can do. He had a smart scheme to get Wheezy Blaine and Phil Whip out of hiding, but I could tell he was planning to keep the money. I pretended to go along with him, sir, in order to locate the money. <laughs> Excuse me, Detective Peters. Well, Dresser, I guess you're a better actor than you realize. Your looks that way, sir. Actor, Commissioner? I don't understand. Your partner came to me three days ago, Detective Peters, and told me where the money was and what he was planning. I gave him my okay, even to leaving the money hidden. Because there are a lot of ears in this city, and if the money was actually turned in, someone might have talked. Yeah, you mean, Johnny, you were just acting like a crooked cop? Weren't you? When you took that money from me, after all, 60 grand, huh? Is sixty grand. Yeah. yeah. That's the way I thought you figured. Peters, I'm glad you did what you did. Convincing proof of your own integrity. And Dresser? Yes, sir. I want to congratulate you. It was a well-worked-out plan. <laughs> Except for one bad mistake. Mistake, Commissioner? Well, look at your partner. I believe they call him Sloppy Peters. And no wonder. Dirt all over him. Face, hands, hair. Your mistake, Dresser, was this. You had him in a bathtub. Why didn't you put in some soap and water, too? Suspense. You've been listening to 60 Grand Missing, written for suspense by Robert Arthur. Heard in tonight's story were Bernard Grant as Dresser. Others in the cast included Ralph Bell, Leon Jenny, Sam Raskin, Joseph Julian, Mason Adams, Michael Caine, and Nat Owen. Listen again next week when we return with Daisy Chain, written by Robert Forrest. Another tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. The Kingston Trio next, followed by latest CBS News and Have Gun Will Travel.